All right, we're continuing our study in the book of Acts. We've gone through chapter number one. Just want to direct your attention, if I may, if you'd go back to page one in your notebook. Just a reminder that we have outlined the book here in these first six pages of your notebook. There are about 150 topics or sections in the 28 chapters that uh, we've kind of pulled out just to uh, note, give special uh, uh, reference to uh, 150 different places. And each one of the chapters has an introduction that, is, uh, that accompanies it. I should say each chapter, every one of the 40 messages that this, that this study originally came from, uh, each one of them has an introduction. So there's about 200 different references here in the table of contents. But lo- looking at it, the, what we did here in, the, uh, in the first, uh, our first sessions, we looked at the characteristics of true discipleship. And that was, uh, we weren't doing an expository study there. We were just trying to take, what does the Bible say about disciples? What are disciples? Disciples are people who uh, truly love one another. By this shall all men know that you're my disciple, that you have love one for another. That's a mark of true discipleship. Another one, John chapter 8, is if you continue in my word, then are you my disciple indeed. So there's some characteristics or marks of true discipleship. We looked at that. Then we looked uh, at uh, verses 1 through 14, where the baton, uh, figuratively speaking, is passed uh, from Christ. His ascension is recorded there, and he gives a commission uh, again to his disciples. He gave them a commission in each of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And again here in Acts chapter number 1, he gives a commission. He says, "Ye shall be witnesses unto me. Witnesses. Powerful, important word. It shows up over and over and over again in the book of Acts. We are called, they were called, and we are called to be witnesses. Again, like being a witness in a courtroom. We are called upon to tell what we know. What we know about this person, this situation, this event, this incident, we are to be witnesses. That's our primary responsibility. We call that evangelism. We call that soul winning. Some people might accomplish that by passing out tracts. Some people accomplish that by uh, television or radio evangelism. Lots of different ways. Then we went to uh, the second half of chapter number one. We talked about the uh, Um, business meeting and the prayer meeting that show up as the disciples are preparing themselves to move on. They're waiting for the promise of the Spirit that's coming in chapter number two. They have a prayer meeting, right thing to do, and they have a business meeting. They have to elect a replacement for Judas who has failed, who has hung himself according to the scriptures. And uh, Judas is then replaced by a man named Matthias. Although we never read about Matthias uh, after chapter number one, any place in the New Testament, his name is never mentioned again. But right now we want to move into uh, chapter number two. Chapter number two, and we've entitled this Pentecost. Pentecost. It's a very familiar word amongst Christians. Pentecost. Pentecost. Uh, was an event, a Jewish event, not primarily a Christian event, although most of us understand it is a Christian event that follows the resurrection of Christ. But Pentecost was a Jewish event, one of its feast days, that uh, followed, it was celebrated 50 days after Passover. That's why it's a Jewish event. Now, it was on that particular occasion and I don't mean coincidentally in the coincidentally sense of the word, but it was on that occasion that the Holy Spirit actually came upon the disciples in Acts chapter number 2. So let's look at our introduction, if we might, here on page 29. As we began our study in the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, we stated 
that it is our goal to carefully examine the character, conduct, and the means by which these first Christian disciples carried out the command of Christ to go into all the world and preach the gospel. So character is important. What kind of people were they? What were their methods, their strategies, what were their priorities and all of that? It is only reasonable to believe that God has given us a record, and I like to use the term, phrase, an instruction manual showing us how we can get his work done. So I look at the book of Acts as an instruction manual. It's kind of like uh, when you buy a new car, they have this little book in the glove compartment, and when you open it up, it describes how everything in that car is supposed to operate how you're to maintain it, how you operate the power seats or the radio or the power sunroof or whatever it is. It tells you all about the pieces and the parts of the automobile. It's kind of an instruction manual, if you please. The Bible is an instruction manual for life. And the book of Acts is an instruction manual for the church. It serves as a bridge from the ministry of Christ into the New Testament local church. And it tells us how all of this, all of this church stuff that we're engaged in now, how it got started, and it kind of sets some norms or patterns that we ought to follow ourselves. It's not talking primarily about methodologies. It's not talking primarily about uh, individuals who were the uh, most revered characters in all of that but what it's talking about is what happened and how did it happen and why did it happen and in what order did it happen so we look at this as an instruction manual for for life notice the term pentecost in the third paragraph on 29 uh, we're confronted with this term the term comes from the greek and it means 50th based on the feast day noted in Leviticus chapter 23. As the term is used in the New Testament, it refers to a festival celebrated on the seventh Sunday after Resurrection Sunday. It's also called Wit Sunday. To the Jew, the day was also known as Shavuot or Sabbath, uh, pronounced Shav Shavuot, with the emphasis on the third syllable. Just I'm not very good at my Hebrew, a little rusty in my Hebrew. When Christians hear the term Pentecost, they normally think of the day that the church began. Now, there's a truth in that because the New Testament Pentecost, I believe, is the day. That's arguable, but that's a good starting point for the church. But it's really an Old Testament term. The next paragraph uh, shares some of the thoughts where it comes from in the Old Testament. And I would encourage you to look up uh, these passages and see the Feast of Weeks and the Feast of Harvest and the Day of First Fruits. All of these things are references or terms that are used for Jewish feasts in the Old Testament. In fact, what follows below on this page, on page 29, is kind of a review of all of these Jewish feasts. The Jews had essentially seven major feasts, and still do, by the way, that they celebrate. That's all part of their tradition, part of their history, and uh, each one of these has a biblical passage or precedent set for them. So the first one, I think most of us are familiar with the Passover. The Passover takes us all the way back into the book of Exodus, chapter number 12, when the children of Israel were uh, captive when they were enslaved in Egypt. Of course, they didn't start that way. When Joseph went down there, they were treated very favor favorably. When Jacob followed, uh, he treated very favorably in their family. But as their family grow grew, they became a threat. And as generations uh, passed by, the Jewish people, the, uh, as we know them, they became a threat. Uh, to the Egyptians. Their population expanded rapidly. Uh, they were uh, productive. They, were, they, they benefited greatly from being there. And uh, jealousy was the result of all that. Unleavened bread really is 
part, or I should say Passover is part of the unleavened bread celebration, or we could say vice versa. But you can see in the right column there on page 29 that there is a symbolic representation of each one of these. The, pa the uh, Passover represents redemption. The unleavened bread, which was a week-long uh, celebration, represents our holy walk in Christ in the New Testament. First fruits, Le Leviticus, <clears throat> represents in the New Testament the resurrection of Christ. Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection. Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Ghost, in Leviticus chapter 23, describes it as a Jewish feast in the Old Testament. Trumpets, feast of trumpets, we talk about the regathering of Israel. Uh, we talk about the rapture being pictured in the feast of trumpets. Leviticus chapter 23, the day of at one -ment or atonement. Leviticus chapter 23, the atonement of Israel, which I believe is still and ultimately will be a future event. I believe that God is still dealing with the nation of Israel. Um, we, I am premillennial. I believe that God has a future for the nation of Israel. I believe that there will be a 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ in Jerusalem and that Israel will realize the promises of the kingdom yet. I don't believe they've been displaced by the church. We do not subscribe to covenant the, uh, theology. We noted that the book of Acts is a book of transitions listed on page 30. The general outline of the book of Acts is included in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost part of the earth. Let's rehearse that one more time. We see that the book of Acts starts in Jerusalem. That's chapters 1 into the beginning of chapter number 8. The gospel then after, after Pentecost, it begins to move out of Jerusalem after the persecution primarily of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. We see that it moves to Judea and Samaria. By the time we get to Acts chapter 13, Paul the Apostle has been converted in Acts chapter 9. Other things have happened. Paul has been trained. And by Acts chapter 13, he is commissioned by the church at Antioch with Barnabas to go into all the world, the first missionary trip out of three missionary trips that Paul himself took. The rest of the book of Acts chronicles those journeys, those trips that... Uh, Paul took. Basically, you've got the commissioning of Paul and Barnabas in chapter 13. You have the first missionary trip. You have the council at Jerusalem. And then you have the second and third missionary trips of Paul. And then finally, Paul uh, has to go, is required to go, to present himself before Caesar at Rome. And that's where the book of Acts ends. So that's really kind of the summation of what's taking place. All right, so down at the bottom of page number 30, we see an outline of the day of Pentecost. So this is 47 verses, this chapter. So let's take the time to read through it. I want to read the scripture when we get together. I don't want you to sit there and just listen to what George Grace says and what he thinks, but let's read God's word. And um, I want you to pay close attention to the things that you do know Maybe some questions you might have as we go through. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as, they, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that they 
every man heard them speak in his own language. This is tongues. This is what the Bible says about tongues. This is what it was. They heard every man speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia, in Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. That is a definition, a description of the gift of tongues originally imparted on Pentecost. How people get this so messed up is beyond me. And how we come up with, you know, angelic languages. I know I've read the material. I've read the passages of Scripture. But this is a clear definition in Scripture of what happened on Pentecost and what the gift of tongues was. Essentially, the gift of tongues was a reversal of Babel, Genesis chapter 11, a reversal of the Tower of Babel. It was in Genesis 11 that God confused our languages. And it's in Acts chapter 2, through the gift of tongues, that he unconfused our tongues. And that's what the gift of tongues is defined as, described as, and used for in this early church. Okay, let's pick it up then in verse 12. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words, for these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing that it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord, day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know him, <clears throat> being delivered. By the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, and I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart <clears throat> rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer <clears throat> thy holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us until this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to, his, to, the, to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. 
He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into heaven, but he saith himself, the Lord said unto my right hand, unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this, that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Well, I'm going to stop right there for a moment. We could read through a whole chapter, but we'll be back over all of this material in, uh, in this lesson and lessons to come. We talked about, and I'm going to move over to page 31 in our notes now, we talked about the day of Pentecost was fully come. Again, we've described Pentecost, Pentecost although we understand it uh, largely as a Christian feast day, 50 days, 50 Pentecost, following the resurrection of Christ. It originally the term originally comes from a Jewish feast that was 50 days following the, uh, the Passover. Notice verse 1, it says, When that day was fully come, they were all, here we are again, with one accord in one place. <clears throat> they were all with one accord. Now, as we noted, this could be the same upper room. We mentioned that. Um, uh, that where the Last Supper was, uh, was uh, celebrated. But the phrase one accord, and we saw this in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, and we want to reemphasize the unity and the harmony of this early church. There is strength in unity. One of the characteristics of God himself is unity. A trinity is, in unity. Unity is an attribute of God. God wants his people to reflect his attributes. Now, some of his attributes we cannot. We cannot be all-knowing. We are not all-powerful. We cannot be in every place. But we can be loving. We can be kind. We can be charitable, and we can be united. So when we are in one accord, when we are united with one another, we are reflecting the attribute or in the attributes of God. This is pleasing to him. And that's why we read this over and over in the text. They were together. <clears throat> it says in verse 2 that a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind took place. Apparently, this has to be something supernatural that took place. This is the day of Pentecost. I have heard preachers preach, we need another Pentecost. Well, uh, there is a some truth in that, I suppose, but we need to be careful. We are not going to recreate by coming to church in a church service and even through prayer, we are not going to recreate all of the special, unique circumstances that we find here in the book of Acts. A supernatural sound from heaven. A mighty wind, it says in verse number 2. There appeared unto them cloven tongues. They appeared. They appeared. They saw them. Have you ever been in a church service where you saw, literally, cloven tongues like as a fire in the church service that weren't a special effect put on by the pastor or the evangelist. I might ask that question. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. I'm not, I'm not sure that um, what we're reading here, that there was a description, a, a physical description that they could say, this is exactly what this was like. 
this could be the best I can describe this is that they were cloven tongues like as a fire. That's the best description I can come up with. Each individual received this promise or this power or this endowment of the Spirit. And it says they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. So, you ever been to a church service <laughs> where all the people in that church service, all of them were filled with the Holy Ghost? Now, I'm not making light or fun of any of this or anyone else. What I am doing is this. I'm simply saying this is a unique once in a, an eternity, if you please, a one-time set of circumstances or event. They were all filled. It, w it appears at this point in time that the baptism and the filling of the Holy Ghost took place at the same time. They took place together. And we have to be careful, and this is why I emphasize the uniqueness of this event, we must be careful not to use this event as a precedent or a pattern or a template for all future receptions. Fire? Wind? Rushing mighty wind? All were filled with the Holy Ghost? This was a unique and special event. And I believe that's why many theologians believe this is the, what we would call the beginning of the church took place here. This is where the disciples received or the apostles received the gift of the promises that Jesus said that the Father would deliver unto them. And this is the beginning. This was the promise of the Father. Uh, Matthew chapter 3 at the bottom of the page is worth reading. Notice in Luke 24, 49, I send the promise of my Father. Acts chapter 1, verse 4, page 32. For the promise, wait for the promise of the Father. Acts chapter 2, verse 33. The received of the Father, the promise of the Holy Ghost. I believe that's what's taken place. Several references that Christ made and are found in the book of Acts, references to this promise of the Father. I believe this is the fulfillment of this. So, what were they expecting when they, were, when they received these promises, or promises to receive the promise, what were they expecting? So I've listed several passages of Scripture going back, John 7, John 14 and 15 and 16. I've listed several places and then Luke chapter 24 where this promise was spoken of by Christ himself. So this is what they're waiting for. They're waiting. They're not waiting because they're lazy. They're not waiting because... They don't know what to do. They're doing what they were told to do. They're waiting. They're waiting. They're waiting for the promise of the Father because it was at this event that they would be empowered to complete or to fulfill the ministry that was given to them. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Notice at the bottom of page 33, we have verses 5 through 13. We've noted that these are, at Jerusalem, they're Jews out of every nation. Remember, Jesus sent his disciples, chapter 10 of the book of Matthew, unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Even Paul the apostle later on understood that the gospel was to the Jew first and also to the Greek or to the Gentile. So, Jesus' primary ministry initially and the ministry of the disciples in the early chapters of the book of Acts was to reach out to the people of Israel. They should have been prepared. That was the ministry of John the Baptist. He was preparing the Jewish people to receive Christ, to receive the Messiah. 
That's what this is all about. Some got it, most didn't, apparently, from reading the scriptures. Some got it, some didn't. Jesus promised the disciples in John that he would send, after he departed, after his ascension, that he would send a comforter to empower them for the mission that he had called them to. Now, what's going on here in uh, chapter number 2? Notice the headline there on 33, Confusion and Amazement, because this was such a unique occasion. Again, I want to emphasize what tongues, the gift of tongues, is in the context of Acts chapter 2. Known languages. There are men, individuals, from 17 different countries, geographical locations. They're all Jews, according to the text. But that doesn't mean that they all speak Hebrew or understand Hebrew. They're from a variety of countries. Jewish males were required, according to the book of Deuteronomy, they were required to report to Jerusalem three times a year to celebrate, to worship. Pentecost was one of those times. So we have a large gathering. Some say there could have been as many as a million people at Passover and at Pentecost in Jerusalem. So Peter is preaching primarily to this large Jewish audience from all of these countries. Now, how are they going to get the message when they all speak different languages? What happened was a miracle. Peter preached what language he used. Maybe he spoke in Aramaic. Probably did. But the listeners from 17 different countries, they heard him in their own language. That's what took place. These weren't angelic languages. It wasn't gobbledygook. It wasn't words that were just had no essential meaning to anybody. And then someone had to interpret these strange sounds coming out of this man's mouth. <clears throat> That's not what we read about here. We see that in some places in churches but that's not what happened in the book of Acts. That's not what happened in the book of Acts. We don't see what some people described as the gift of tongues in congregational worship. We don't see that anywhere in the scriptures. You really have to go to 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 and kind of milk it out of there to make, make that kind of sense out of those statements. Well, there was confusion. confusion. So many different languages. But there, were, there was amazement. It says in verse 6 that they were confounded because every man heard them speak in his own language. And then they were questioned, are not all these which speak Galileans? Now that was a pejorative reference. They were from the other side of the tracks. They were the non-intellectuals. They were the non-elites. And they're preaching to us. But listen, we hear them in our languages. This was uh, critically said. This was not, in a sense, boy, are we amazed. These Galileans are smart people. It was a pejorative reference. And then we have a list of all of these different people. And what were they talking about? They were talking about the wonderful works of God. That was the purpose of the filling of the Spirit, to speak of the wonderful works of God. The tongues were not for self-edification. They were given to speak the wonderful works of God. And I said before, this is the reversal of the Tower of Babel. And it says in 12 and 13 that they were all amazed and were in doubt. This is... This has never happened before. This is a strange occasion, and others were mocking. So there's all different kinds. When the Word of God, when God is referenced, there's all kinds of results. 
We see this in Acts chapter 17 at Mars Hill when uh, Paul went and preached there at Mars Hill. Uh, there were some people that believed. There were some that said well, they procrastinated. And there were some that mocked. I think that's 17, 32, 33, or 34. But the gift of tongues, from what I see, is a reversal of Babel. Genesis chapter number 11. The question is then asked, what meaneth this? And Peter then proceeds to answer the question. What is this all about? And that's where we're going to take a break right now. Before we get into P Peter's sermon about the last days here and the rest of Acts chapter 2, we're going to stop here and ponder the question, what's going on here? What is this really all about people? So let's take a break.